Hi everyone, uh, the man next needs no introduction, but I will try. Uh, Rick Doblin is the founder and executive director of the Multi Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, known as MAPS. He received his doctorate in public policy from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, where he wrote his dissertation on the regulation of medical uses of psychedelics and marijuana. His professional goal is to help develop legal context for the beneficial uses of psychedelics and marijuana, primarily as a prescription medicine, but also for personal growth and otherwise health, healthy people. Um, Rick, welcome to SciTech. And thank you all for um, participating today, whether it's a uh, morning, afternoon, or evening, or night, wherever you happen to be. And so what I'm going to start out talking today is about uh, a path to the future and where that'll lead us. And then I'll drop back and speak about MAPS and what we're doing and how we're going to get to that future. So this talk, Breakthrough Therapy, the Future of Psychedelic Assisted Psychotherapy. Um, I, I'm starting with this slide because this slide, which looks quite psychedelic, was actually created by the FDA. And they presented it about a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, at the American Society for Clinical Psychopharmacology when they announced that they were going to be working on a guidance document for sponsors of psychedelic research. So it's a document to help people who want to do psychedelic research with best practices. And so the main point that I'm trying to make by this is that the FDA, despite some problems that I'll talk about later, is basically science over politics and we have an open door and they are really willing to permit research to move forward and i think this is the ground on which everything has been built all of the psychedelic renaissance has been built on this um, fda willingness to uh, permit psychedelic research and that started in 1992 and we've been building on that ever since um, there's a whole lot of different potentials for psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. So um, by this, I am including uh, ketamine, uh, MDMA in the overall word uh, psychedelic for mind manifesting. Um, there's uh, depression, as we all know about S ketamine being approved for depression, but there's also research been done with ayahuasca. There's two groups that are working on psilocybin for treatment resistant depression or major depressive disorder, MDMA. Um, end of life distress with psilocybin, MDMA, LSD, PTSD, uh, MDMA, ketamine, ayahuasca, psilocybin, substance abuse. Um, and we could add LSD, although there's no research right now going on with LSD for substance abuse, uh, social anxiety, MDMA, obsessive compulsive disorder, psilocybin, eating disorders. We're about to start studies with MDMA. There's also psilocybin for eating disorder. So there's an enormous range of possibilities for psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. These are not an exhaustive list, nor an exhaustive list of the drugs. But this is just to give you a sense of what's underway, what's possible in the, in the field as we move forward. Um, also moving forward is deeper into the government. This is a protocol with Rachel Yehuda at the Bronx VA. It would be looking at MDMA assisted psychotherapy for PTSD, comparing two MDMA sessions versus three. In a sense, it's a economic uh, cost effectiveness study. Uh, what are the results 12 months out after two sessions versus three sessions? Um, but we've been trying for 30 years to get permission to do research inside um, the Veterans Administration. And we're waiting any day now, we're going to hear from FDA probably next week um, about what they think about this particular protocol. Um, this was the um, magazine of disabled American veterans. It's 1.3 million members. Um, comes out every uh, two months in print and online. And the cover article of this was about our MDMA PTSD research. So this is just, again, to suggest that um, we've overcome the stigma of psychedelics in large part, and that uh, the Veterans Administration and the VA are now starting to, uh, and the veteran community themselves are, are really very much supportive of psychedelic research. Um, we're also working with the police. So the future of this is not just being embedded more within uh, the Veterans Administration, the Department of Defense, but also Sarko Gregarian is a police psychotherapist. 
who's going through our training program to learn how to administer MDMA to police officers with trauma. What I've learned recently is that um, veterans have preferential hiring at police uh, departments. So not only do they come often with trauma from the war, but then they get um, trauma from the police. So this is also part of the mainstreaming. Um, group therapy is a big part of what we're going to be doing in the future as well. Although we haven't started it yet, we're talking with Brian Anderson about group therapy for people with PTSD from the sexual orientation. Uh, we still have to raise the money for this study, so it's not a sure thing, but I'm uh, mainly pointing out that while all of the research that's being done now on an individual level is um, very important and that's the way we're starting, but we do want to explore the possibilities of group psychotherapy. And the concern is that the more severe PTSD or the more severe depression, uh, potentially uh, the more individual support people need. So anyway, this is a big area of research to be explored in the future. Um, Post-approval, the future is going to be determined by REMS, the risk evaluation and mitigation strategies that we negotiate with FDA. And the basic outlines are not finalized, but we're already basically saying that um, the only people that can treat patients and prescribe these drugs are people that have been through training with the sponsor, either MAPS or Compass or USONA or, or Mind Medicine or whatever, that the spawn, because the treatments are not the drug, the treatments are the drug assisted psychotherapy. So only people that understand the psychotherapy part of it will be able to um, offer the treatments and we will need to train them. Then they can innovate, they can do what they want, but they will be need to be trained. It will only be in clinics that are under direct supervision. So it's never going to be a take home drug. Eventually, we might be able to treat people who are too uh, sick or emotionally um, frightened to leave their homes. Maybe we can treat them in their homes, but it's only going to be under direct supervision. And it'll be a centralized pharmacy that ships the medicines to the prescribers, not to the patients. And there'll be certain kind of safety parameters. The things that are below the dotted line, the patient registry and a potential lifetime list are things that um, we are not proposing. The FDA might want to impose that on us, but we're not sure yet. And um, whether this exact same thing would be the case for psilocybin or MDMA is not clear. But uh, this is what we're already in uh, preliminary negotiations with the FDA on what post-approval regulations would look like. Um, there will be psychotherapy clinics. There's going to be thousands and thousands and thousands of these. And I think what uh, we're trying to illustrate with this slide is that while everybody who is um, going to be treating people has to be trained by the sponsor. So if Compass gets psilocybin approved for uh, treatment resistant depression or USONA gets approved by uh, for major depressive disorder, they will need to train people. But then once these people are trained, they can do whatever um, they want. They can modify the treatments. But if we certify them, that means that when you go to one of these clinics, you know what you're getting in for, that they will be delivering the treatment method that's in the treatment manual of the sponsor, the treatment method that was used to approve the drug. So, and then ketamine assisted psychotherapy, we are talking about, um, you know, Janssen and Johnson and Johnson has um, Spravato, but I think more and more, they're, they're just proposing that as a pharmacological treatment. I think more and more we're gonna end up with uh, providers of ketamine who add psychotherapy to it and then buy the generic ketamine, which is a uh, hundredth or more or less, I mean, less than a hundredth of the cost of Spravato. So, I think we may be going into situations like that. But anyway, this is the idea that there'll be clinics. I don't think there'll be a network of MAPS clinics or field trip clinics or Compass clinics or USONA clinics. They'll be cross-trained in multiple different modalities. And these will really be psychedelic psychotherapy clinics. So I think that's what the future will hold for us. Um, I imagine by uh, 2030, there'll be about 6,000 clinics with uh, roughly 20, 200,000 staff. Uh, major jobs program, you know, there's uh, 358,000 staff at hospice centers in the United States, uh, 577,000 mental health professionals, uh, 334 massage, massage therapists. So I think these psychedelic clinics are going to be um, 
very much of a jobs program, and we're going to have thousands of them, we believe, throughout the United States and eventually throughout Europe and the world. Um, there will be, of course, uh, some direct-to-consumer ads in the United States. It's one of the few countries that permits it. I don't think it's a good idea, but and we may or may not need to do this. This was just a fake one that we created uh, just to give an idea of what the future might hold. This is advertising from the California Institute for Integral Studies for people that want careers in psychedelic psychotherapy. This is also a graphically made up image, but they're also going ahead and um, training people for careers in psychedelic assisted therapy. So I think there's going to be a lot of that. Um, there will be health insurance. This is going to be a big, uh, this is just a mock-up that we made, of course. Um, there is going to be a lot of work on cost effectiveness studies. Uh, we just uh, were reviewing one that's going to be submitted for publication by a fellow, Elliot Marseille, who's an expert in um, healthcare economics about the cost effectiveness of um, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD. So we believe that this is a very important thing for us to be working on. Uh, to make sure that insurance covers it so it's more equitably available to people. Um, legalization will follow medicalization. And so this is a chart of American supporters, American voters' support for the legalization of marijuana. Um, it ends in around 2018, 64%. It's continued to grow. The main point here is if you look from around 1977 or so to around uh, 1997, a 20-year span there was basically no movement in the support for um, legalization of marijuana and support started building starting in 1996, which is the same year that um, California and Arizona passed medical marijuana initiatives. And then we can pretty much parallel the rise of medical marijuana states with the rising support for the legalization of marijuana. People have been uh, told so much that's so frightening about marijuana, about psychedelics. They don't know what to believe, but when they start seeing medicalization and they realize that under certain circumstances, there are benefits that outweigh the risks, and then people are starting to tell stories about getting healed, that's what changes attitudes. So legalization will follow medicalization. Um, and we have this uh, situation now in Denver in the United States with the deprioritization of psilocybin mushrooms, meaning it's the lowest enforcement priority. In Oakland, they've done the same with plant psychedelics in Oregon. On the ballot in November is going to be the Oregon Psilocybin Initiative to try to make um, a whole new approach of state-regulated providers that will be providing not just for patients, but for personal growth. So we are very much in favor of this. We don't think people should have to go to doctors or to um, religions to have access to psychedelic experiences. They should be able to get it in what we're calling licensed legalization. And so I think we'll have this by 2035. You know, we still don't quite have uh, federal legalization of marijuana in the United States, but I think it'll take a decade or more of clinics being set up and then we'll, we'll change people's attitudes in 2035. And maybe I'm wrong, hopefully it'll be sooner will have licensed legalization. So it's not normal what we think about the way alcohol or marijuana is being legal. They'll, you'll have to get a license for it. And you'll have to do some educational materials. For certain psychedelics, I think you'll have to get psychedelics uh, under direct supervision in one of these clinics, and then you get a license. And then if you end up uh, misbehaving, you lose your license and you get punished for your misbehavior. This is the way it should be for alcohol. Drunk drivers often lose their driver's license, but they can still get alcohol and get drunk and kill people. So I think we need a licensed legalization system. And then the big question is going to be what's going to happen to minors. So it'll be a legal, I think, for adults, which hopefully will set as 18 or older. But um, in the United States, 23 states have what are called parental override laws. So it is against the law for minors to have alcohol, but with their parents' permission, um, they can uh, minors can receive alcohol in private or in public. And so I think that's the way we should be handling psychedelics, that it's um, given to the family to decide how to educate their own children. And if you look at the traditional cultures that do integrate psychedelics successfully, the Native American church, the ayahuasca churches, uh, they don't have age limits like this kids that are called to it. They often get uh, smaller doses, but they get support from their families. And that's how we think we're going to do it. So I think that's the, the future 
um, over the next uh, uh, 15 years. Now, how are we going to get there? MDMA is working on, uh, MAPS, I mean, is working on MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for treating PTSD. Um, this is our structure. MAPS now has um, two corporations, well, multiple, we're making more, but we have the um, nonprofit MAPS, which was created in 1986, and then uh, the Public Benefit Corporation was created in uh, December 2014. It is a for-profit company like Eleusis. I want to thank uh, Shlomi Raz for educating me about the uh, value of the Benefit Corporation structure, and that is how the Eleusis Benefit Corp is structured. So um, the Benefit Corp is for-profit. It's our pharmaceutical development arm. It's got about 55 people right now. And it is doing the research and it will market MDMA uh, by prescription, make a profit, but not maximizing profit, maximizing public benefit. And the profit will be taxable and whatever money is uh, remaining will be um, returned to MAPS and then used for further research, returned back to the Public Benefit Corp or for our educational activities. But there's no private ownership here. That's why our structure is fundamentally different. It's the nonprofit is the 100% owner of the Public Benefit Corporation. What makes it work is this, um, <clears throat> or makes it possible, is this bill that was passed by Ronald Reagan in 1984 that provided incentives for developing drugs that were off patent. And these incentives are called data exclusivity. So what it means is that no one can use the data to market a generic in the U.S., It'll end up being six years uh, in Europe, it's 10 years. Other people, other sponsors, if they wanted, could generate their own data. So it's not a patent. We have exclusive use on our own data, but other people can generate their own data. Although it'll take them five or six years or more, 150 million or whatever to do. It's not gonna cost us that much, but I think our cost structure is way lower and we have lots of volunteers. Um, so we've got a price advantage. But in any case, I think it's unlikely other people will do it. But if they wanted to, they can. And so this is the um, approach for psilocybin as well. You know, the S-ketamine people took the idea of uh, developing an isomer and patenting that. I don't think the isomers of psilocybin or the isomers of MDMA are any better than the uh, racemic mixture. So in any case, this is uh, our structure is based on something that Ronald Reagan did. I did not notice this when it was happening. We were involved in suing the DEA or at this time. Um, so I was very involved in regulatory affairs and suing the DEA, but this sort of um, other aspect of things missed me completely. So when I started MAPS in 86, um, I had no knowledge of the data exclusivity provisions. I just thought it would become uh, generic, which was fine. We need to make it available to people. Um, this is basically um, MAPS team. Uh, we have the executive, the fundraising, communications, media, education, events, operations, our Zendo psychedelic harm reduction and our advocacy team. Um, this is our clinical research team uh, led by a group of women who mostly came over from Novartis. And so um, this is where we're growing. If uh, people want jobs, they should check out uh, uh, the MAPS website for job leads. Uh, mostly we're hiring in the pharmaceutical drug development area. Um, and then we have uh, principal investigators We and uh, therapy training program. We've trained hundreds of therapists. So this is just to give you a, a, a sense of the scope of MAPS. Since its founding, we've raised over $80 million for psychedelic therapy and medical marijuana research. Now that's a lot of money, but it's also over 34 years. And most of the money has been in the last couple of years. We haven't needed a lot of it because the government just kept saying no to us. So we didn't have a lot of research to pay for. But now that we're in phase three and we're scaling up and going global, uh, we're needing a lot more money. We are uh, collaborating with the PSFC, which stands for the Psychedelic Science Funders Collaborative. Uh, a lot of pe people from tech. <clears throat> and we're starting what's called the capstone campaign to raise $3 million more. This would be for completing phase three trials, getting FDA approval, and then that will be followed by Israeli Ministry of Health and Health Canada. It'll support commercialization. 10 million of this is commercialization related activities, our expanded access program, compassionate use and grow our therapy training program. We've already raised $10 million of this $30 million 
from our board of directors and close allies, and we should have good news uh, about some of the others. Um, portion of this money that we'll release in a couple weeks. Um, we have 11 sites in the United States, two in Israel and two in Canada for our phase three locations. We've already negotiated with the European Medicines Agency and we're gonna need another 30 million for phase three for EMA and globalization. Once we have the data for FDA, we have the data for EMA, pretty much every country in the world except for Japan and China, um, we're well, they'll want studies in their own countries, um, but for most of the countries of the world, once you get FDA and EMA, you can have um, agreements with these countries to use the same data to get approval in those countries. So we hope near the end of this year that we'll be um, working on starting to raise this 30 million. Um, we, and actually we already have uh, about uh, 2 million of it. So that's our, uh, this is our countries in Europe that we're thinking about working in. We've got approval now in about half of these countries to start the training of therapists um, in an open label study. It's a final step of training therapists is to have them um, treat a patient under supervision from our therapy team. Um, just to say this, we have bipartisan support. Uh, the Mercer family, Rebecca Mercer gave us a million dollars over four years for PTSD research. Her only limitation was uh, it go to veterans. She supported Steve Bannon and Trump, and they own Cambridge Analytica uh, and Breitbart. They're minority holders. Elizabeth Koch has pledged nine, uh, two point seven million. Her father is Charles Koch from the Koch brothers. Elizabeth is uh, apolitical and but very sensitive about trauma, and is very interested in helping us. The Rockefellers have donated uh, over two million dollars from the Rockefeller family. Uh, George Soros from Open Society Foundation supported our uh, training for therapists of color. So this is just to say we have uh, broad, broad bipartisan support in terms of our funders. We also have thousands and thousands of funders that have just sent us $5, $10 and $100. So it's really um, a very um, large group of funders uh, and diverse. Um, so 30 years after MAP started, we had our end of phase two meeting with the FDA I won't go into what happened during 30 years, just a lot of work uh, and a lot of struggle. And we presented this data from our phase two data. The placebo group is therapy with no MDMA or inactive MDMA, uh, low dose MDMA, I mean. And um, so they all get therapy. Um, and these are chronic, severe, treatment resistant PTSD patients. And after roughly 42 hours of therapy, um, 23% no longer have PTSD two months after the last experimental session, which is actually really great for this group of treatment resistant, severe chronic PTSD patients. But when you add MDMA, um, it more than doubles to 56% no longer have PTSD. This is the data point, the two month following the treatment, um, comparing the two groups that the FDA will look at for approving the drug. But for insurance companies, we look at one year out as well. And what we find is that people keep getting better. Two thirds no longer have PTSD at the one year follow up. And of the one third that still does have PTSD, uh, most of them have had clinically significant reductions of their PTSD symptoms. And if we could have given them one or two more sessions, maybe they would also no longer have PTSD. But these are our phase two results. On the basis of this, we compared them to Zoloft and Paxil, which are the two drugs uh, approved by the FDA for PTSD. This is the effect size, which is the magnitude of the effect. And you can see that MDMA so far from our phase two data is better than all of them. And our results are actually much better than what it shows here because what we've done is we have subtracted out the therapy from the therapy plus MDMA. So our control group, as I showed you, is the therapy with 23% no longer having PTSD. The control group for Paxil and Zoloft was an inactive pill. So you do get the placebo effect, but that's it. With us, you get the placebo effect, plus you get the therapy effect in our control group, and we have to subtract that from the therapy plus MDMA. So we still have a large effect size, but in practice, it will be uh, even larger. Um, we then negotiated eight months with the FDA and uh, came to agreement on phase three designs through this special protocol assessment process. This is our um, treatment. It takes three and a half months. There's uh, 12 90 minute non-drug psychotherapy sessions with a male female team 
three before the first session, experimental session, and then three after each experimental session for integration. And someone either gets randomized to the top row, which is uh, therapy plus MDMA, or the bottom row, which is therapy plus inactive placebo. We start with 80 milligrams, everybody gets that, and then half, uh, two hours later, they'll get 40 milligrams for a supplemental dose to extend the plateau. Then we believe we'll encourage everybody to go to 120 milligrams, unless there's a real good reason not to, the second, but it is optional, with a 60 milligram supplemental dose. And then the third, again, could be a discussion between therapists and patients, which seem to be the worst. So there's some variability in the dosing. This is the basic design we agreed on. We agreed on two 100-person phase three studies. And this was what we have to do, two 100-person phase three studies. Um, we then got breakthrough therapy designation. There's only two drugs that have been given breakthrough therapy um, designation by the FDA for PTSD. One was MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. The other was a drug called Tonmaya by Tonix Pharmaceutical Company, and that was a repurposed sleeping pill. So those are the two drugs been designated breakthrough by the FDA for uh, PTSD. Um, we reported in Forbes May 12th on the results of our interim analysis of our first phase three study. It's a sneak peek of the data by an unblinded data monitoring committee. And um, I called it the most important reality check in all of our 34 year history, because this is how we're doing in phase three. We were able to conduct this after all 100 participants had been enrolled in the first of the two phase three studies, but 60 participants or 60% had completed their primary outcome measure. and. The outcomes where we set it up, our power calculations to have a 90% or greater probability of statistical significance. The best outcome from the interim analysis is uh, continue the study unchanged, meaning your actuals compared to your hypotheticals, um, or you're told to add more subjects to the study, which means that the effect size wasn't quite as big as we had predicted, but um, you still get approval on the basis of statistical significance, not effect size. And so this would have been the number of patients that we had to add to restore it to a 90% probability of statistical significance, or we were, would be told to stop the study altogether for futility for either um, safety or efficacy. And to make you uh, realize how important this is, not all drugs that are breakthrough and not all drugs that are in phase three succeed. So in February of this year, the interim analysis for Tanmaya was conducted and they were told that they should stop the study for futility after they'd spent well over a hundred million dollars. And uh, Seth Letterman, we are disappointed for patients suffering from PTSD that the interim analysis did not detect a signal that would warrant continued enrollment in this phase three study. These results underscore the difficulty in treating PTSD. Well, in contrast, our interim analysis was month one month later and we were told continue the study as originally designed unchanged. We didn't need to add anybody. We have at least a 90% or potentially greater probability that we will get statistically significant results with an effect size of at least a medium effect size. So this was the best possible news we could get. Since then, the FDA has approached us and said, um, because of COVID, and not just us, they're approaching other sponsors, and they said, would you like to end your study early? Because we've had to slow down and, and basically end enrollment. And so we proposed to the FDA that we end the study with 90 people, not all of whom will have finished all three sessions, but those will have completed at least one outcome measure despite COVID by the end of June. And we will have what we call data lock uh, analysis completed before the end of August. And the FDA um, just a, a week ago said yes to this. So we will know uh, in a couple months uh, if our first uh, phase three study worked. Um, we're starting uh, 10 expanded access sites, which are compassionate use around the United States as well. Um, again, as soon as we can start treating subjects, these are where patients pay for the treatment themselves. There's no um, control group and the FDA doesn't look to this data for approval, but they will look at the safety data. Um, and so we're very excited about this and hopefully this will grow beyond the 50 patients that we've been approved for so far. And the last thing I'll say about this is that we are engaged in a dispute, a formal dispute with the FDA. So not everything they're doing is great. 
And they have put a clinical hold on our protocol to give MDMA to therapists as part of their training. So we're appealing to senior management. And the questions to be addressed are, um, um, does a protocol to administer MDMA to therapists as part of their training pass the risk benefit? Um, we think it will. And does the lead facilitator of the two-person therapy team need to be an MD or PhD? The FDA is currently um, saying that that's the case, not for phase three, because we have special protocol assessment. Um, and we have no difference in outcomes in risk or efficacy with teams that are led by a, a licensed master's level therapist or an MD or PhD. So I think that we've got a good database case to uh, prevail on this. And then also FDA has been lately saying they want a physician on site, even though we just have one on call for um, phase three as well. So uh, this is the um, overall protocol um, issues that we're going to be debating with the FDA going forward. Um, so that is um, my presentation. And now I really look forward to uh, the questions. I'm out, I'm out. <clears throat> Rick, I've got some questions here that people have been dying to ask. Um, but before we jump into it, can you tell us a little bit about Israel and what's going on here in particular and why Israel? Yeah, well, Israel has um, an enormous amount of trauma. And also Israel has some of the very best uh, researchers into PTSD and has a scientific community that's um, already negotiated with FDA, the data that's produced in Israel will be accepted by FDA. And for me, though, the real issue is family. You know, I, I've had a relative move to Israel in 1904 when it was Palestine. She was kind of, I would say, uh, ultra-Orthodox, uh, and she um, wanted to be buried on the Mount of Olives. So she was uh, buried in 1907 on the Mount of Olives, and I've got uh, relatives um, in Israel. So, but what's happening in Israel is that the Ministry of Health is actually moving forward on uh, being the first government in the world that's funding the treatment of people with MDMA assisted psychotherapy. So, they're supporting some of the costs for open access, expanded access in Israel. Uh, we've, uh, it's basically a um, million dollars, and they've put up half a million dollars of fees and services. Uh, facilities, fees like that. And then we're putting up half a million dollars through donors to do that. And so what we understood, though, about um, Israel and also about Health Canada is that they will follow the FDA. So we are gathering, we have 15 sites for phase three, two in Israel, two in Canada, 11 in the U.S. We present the same data to FDA, also to Health Canada and also the Israeli Ministry of Health. And I think they're going to wait until we see what happens with FDA, and then Israel and Canada will go next, and then uh, will be Europe and the rest of the world. And you haven't mentioned set and setting. Um, let's talk a little bit about how that plays into psycho um, uh, psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. How important is it, and how do you measure that? Well, for the FDA, we have to standardize the psychotherapy. So there, the set, what we mean by is the um, mindset that people come into it, the preparation that they've received, the setting is where they do it, what the context is. And then the question is, what is the treatment itself? So we have to standardize the therapy. So we have what's called the treatment manual. If anybody wants to read that, it's up for free on the MAPS website on the bottom of the MDMA page. Um, then also um, we have adherence raters that we've trained to watch the videotapes of the therapy sessions and give the feedback to the therapist as far as whether they're adhering to the manual. And so the answer is to get it approved, we do have to standardize the therapy. And we also try to you know, insist on um, settings that are supportive, that are private, where people could spend the night if they wanted to. And the setting, of course, is therapy that people should be open to whatever happens, whether it's painful, whether it's blissful. A bunch of the people in our studies have said, I don't know why they call this ecstasy, because it's not that pain. It's not that pleasant. It's not like you take a pill and your problems go away and you feel fine. So 
I think the set and setting is very important. And, and we've talked to people who've taken MDMA at raves and prior um, rape have come to their memory and they stuff their feelings down because their friends didn't want to talk about it. And months later, they felt worse. So this is, yeah, that is the manual. And Harry, thank you for that in the chat. So um, the setting is really important. Um, attached bathroom, ideally, so you don't have to go out in public. Um, flowers, you know, just warm. Around half the time, people's idea, eyes are closed. They're inner with uh, listening to music. The other half of the time is dialogue with the therapist with psilocybin. It's more like 90% of the time inner, the rest dialogue. And so set and setting are very important, but the standardization is of the therapy. But once it's approved, therapists can modify the therapy. That's called the practice of medicine. They don't have to stay. And that's where I said before, where we're going to have the um, certified map certified people so that you'll know what you're getting if you go to those so um i've got some other questions but i'll jump to the most voted question now how can someone who dreams of working with psychedelic assisted psychotherapy start i'm finishing my psychology uh, bachelor's in brazil which takes five years where do you go from here um, um program so um you know, no matter what we negotiate with FDA in this formal dispute resolution, the lead person is going to have to be licensed as a therapist. So I would say, you know, go forward and try to get a license as a therapist. Um, the second person we're hoping will eventually be a massage therapist, a music therapist, um, a student being mentored an apprenticeship almost by the lead person. So I think the um, the way in which that um, you can prepare is also do your own experiences. So you're in Brazil, go take ayahuasca, do a bunch of things like that. Um, and um, look for our trainings, read our treatment manual. There's one question here. Um, so if you don't mind, I, it's from James. What work is being done to improve or optimize the ther psychotherapeutic approach? That's really important. Um, we believe that we've developed what we know is to be the most effective therapy. However, we're not saying it, it necessarily is the best. So for political reasons, for um, and also to address that question, we're reaching out to the leaders who are who have developed non-drug psychotherapies for PTSD. For example, um, prolonged exposure, cognitive behavioral therapy, cognitive processing, processing therapy. And we're paying for them to blend MDMA with their existing therapies to see if they can come up with an improved approach. And maybe they can and maybe they can't. The other thing is going to be um, optimizing through group therapy to see if that's going to be more effective. It certainly will be less effective. I mean, less expensive, but but I do believe it'll probably be less effective, but maybe not that much less effective. So I think that we have developed what we believe is the most conducive approach, but we're um, not persuaded by that completely. And um, I think that we really want to see all sorts of efforts being done to um, improve or optimize. So the thing that Rachel Yehuda is trying to talk about, the study that she wants to do at the Bronx VA would be two sessions versus three sessions. So that's not optimizing the method, but that's more trying to figure out about the expenses of it. Can we, I think people with three sessions will get better faster than the people with two sessions, but maybe at one year, they'll be more or less the same but I do believe that there'll be some people that will need more than two sessions and we'll try to sort that out and figure that out. Will the FDA allow unlimited sessions? No, that's the question that I raised before about the REMS. Um, we believe that um, if it doesn't work in 10 or 12 sessions for PTSD, that it's not gonna work, that you don't need more. Now, I've personally taken MDMA about 120 times in my life. And I think I keep gaining from it all the time, but that's not, I'm not treating PTSD. If you were trying to treat PTSD and 10 or 12 sessions or even three or four or five didn't work, there's some question as to whether more will work. So more is not always better. The FDA may go ahead and say, um, there's a limit on it. If so, then we need a patient registry. Um, we It's uh, not about neurotoxicity. We might need just more um, millions of dollars worth of toxicity studies to get approved for more uses than 10 or 12, but we don't think it'll really um, be necessary for PTSD. 
And on your business model, you mentioned uh, an open source element, a public benefit corp. Um, how, how does that ultimately play into how this will be priced to patients? Very important. So there's all different approaches towards pricing. And one way, monopoly pricing, is where you um, sort of um, – you make the most money by really figuring out what's the highest price you can you can charge to the most people. Um, you try to get insurance companies. The, the cost, the, the benefits of this are going to be great because PTSD patients have higher healthcare utilization. They have more emergency room visits, more stress related um, issues. Uh, they cost a lot to the insurance companies. So our pricing is not going to be maximizing profits. It's going to be maximizing social benefits. So I think we'll be on the low end of the pricing. The other issue, of course, is that um, people really only need a few sessions. And so I think that what our real business model is about is about training way more therapists. So we felt that the therapists and the training of the therapists is a business model, but we're going to run it more or less at our cost because the social benefit is getting the most people treated and we can make the money off the sale of MDMA. So right now at these early stages, it costs us almost $500 for three MDMA sessions. And so we figure we'll charge a thousand dollars or something. Hopefully those prices are gonna go way down our cost, um, but we're not gonna be charging you know, $5,000 for the MDMA. The other part of this is to say is that the most, um, of the money is going to go to the therapist, not to the drug. And so we have been approached by business people who say, look, if you charge a thousand dollars or fifteen hundred, it doesn't matter for the patient at the end because the therapy is going to cost eight or ten thousand or, or whatever. So the adding money for the drug is not that much. But again, we're not doing this uh, to maximize profits. We're doing it to maximize uh, mass mental health because the world is on fire. The world's at risk we're destroying the environment. We need more people who've been able to work through their traumas, who've been able to um, see the other as uh, not an enemy, but um, more in common than not. So I think uh, when it, but but that's going to be one of the key issues so to watch. How are we meeting our social benefit uh, mission is to see how do we price the MDMA? And we will make that public. We will disclose what our costs are, which you almost never see. But um yeah, th that's going to be, and what we're trying to do is develop a metric to evaluate um, our public benefit. How are we interpreting? So part of it is the open source, sharing our protocols, sharing our analysis of the MDMA literature, how we work with um, investigators that come to us that want help to do their studies with MDMA. We don't have uh, confidential uh, data agreements. We don't have um, all this kind of stuff so that we're really trying to facilitate the whole field is the thing. Uh, one question, I know we're running out of time, but I'll just say, how can the training of psychedelic therapists best scale up to meet worldwide? That is the key question. And um, I think that, it, and, and the other part I want to say is that we are, because we're a nonprofit, we are committed to making it available to people without having to come to us with being able to get it through legalization, through other ways. I think that's super important. Um, and we're doing a lot with peer support and how people can help each other as friends. But the training of therapists to scale it up, um, we really are focusing on quality, not quantity initially. And then we think we'll have, so we're, we're trying to train more trainers. There will be exponential growth of it, but right now we're limiting it because we want to emphasize quality. Because when you're rolling out something like this, that's been controversial, that's been suppressed, that's been, um, so much pro subject of propaganda, the early rollout is very important. We have to make sure that as it rolls out early, that it's very well-trained therapists or else there could be a backlash. So I think the training of more therapists is going to be critical, but um, it, I think we'll be able to solve that problem. And how long does that training take for a therapist? Well, we have um, five different components of it. So all told, it takes about three weeks. But, you know, and most of these are people that have already been trained as therapists, but we have a 12 hour or so online portion. Then we have a week long portion that's in um, person. I mean, we're switching to do some of that virtual now, but it's not going to be as good. Mostly watching videotapes and of therapy sessions. 
Then we have role play that's about five hours that people have to do and send us the videotapes. We critique that. Then we have a protocol that we're arguing with about the FDA continuing about um, going ahead and giving therapists the opportunity to take MDMA as a patient. Right now that takes uh, five days uh, or four and a half days. We're trying to get that down to two days because uh, we give people um, right now an MDMA session or a placebo session. And then um, we don't need the placebo session anymore. So, so they get that, they get a day of integration, then the crossover, then another day of integration. So um, we're trying to get that. So that's it. And then the final stage is three and a half months, but it's 42 hours. So it's watching somebody work a team again watching them work with a patient and then giving feedback. Um, so they work under supervision. That's the final stage. So over, once everything's up and running, I think it'll take six months or so to train someone. We could maybe compress it into four months, five months, something like that. But it's going to take some time. And is everyone eligible to take those training courses? That's going to depend on our negotiations with FDA. So from our point of view, yes, everybody is eligible to take it. But who is eligible to actually administer it in a research, in a post-approval therapeutic context by prescription? So we want to train people, as we said, for peer support, for um, you know, helping in a post-prohibition world. So we will accept uh, anybody into the training. But again, at the initial stages, we're prioritizing therapists because we want to train people that can work in these therapeutic settings. Um, Non-sponsors will be able to provide the training eventually, um, but not initially. I think that, um, you know, there's going to be such a need for training. Um, once the data exclusivity period expires, I think that there's going to be the possibility of um, other people setting up training programs. Um, we are trying to work with Karen Sarfati in Israel to set up a training program in Israel. And we've got now... Um, a, a, an open ear with the Israeli Ministry of Health with Eric Vermetten, who's the chief psychiatrist for the Dutch Ministry of Defense. He's going to be coordinating our work in um, Europe. And um, so we'll have a therapy training, therapist training session in um, the Netherlands as well. I saw one question, which is um, why must psychotherapists take MDMA as part of their training? This, the reason I'm answering that is that we don't require it. It's not that they must. We don't want to create a cult. We don't want to require people to do this. We don't think you should require anybody to do a drug. We want it to be voluntary, but we encourage it. And it's not that you can't be a good therapist without ever taking MDMA. It's just you would be better if you know what drug you're giving to your patients. Psychiatrists are not required to get electroshock in order to give it to their patients. But electroshock is a pharmacological treatment. It doesn't depend on the, the therapeutic alliance. We know that the therapeutic alliance between patients and therapists is a key factor for how well patients do. And we think that that will be enhanced by therapists and psychiatrists having the option to volunteer to take MDMA. And we think that same is true for psilocybin. So Israel is really leading the way in government support for this sort of research and helping us. And, and I think it... Um, it will be great once we can start the training center, uh, Israel, Netherlands, and the U.S. as well. Amazing. Well, uh, we're running over time. Thank you, Rick, for taking the time to join us live um, and continued success and amazing what you're doing. And hopefully we can contribute more uh, to the MAPS cause uh, like we did with uh, Christian and, and Mr. Linton. That was great. Thank you, Saul. Thank you for hosting this discussion because I think as this uh, field gets uh, more and more people investing in it, uh, we really need to be sharing with each other what we know. And as I said, the early rollouts are going to determine the future. So um, it's these kind of conferences that are helping us share information. So you guys are doing great to host these conferences. Thank you so much, Rick.